Thank you, Chris. And uh, good morning again, everyone. Uh, if you're new to Woodside, uh, my name is Dan, and uh, welcome again this morning. And everyone, welcome uh, to the first Sunday of 2020. And uh, today we're starting a brand new series uh, called Hope for Relationships. All of us here are in relationships. You may be married, you may be single, uh, widow, widower, divorced. Uh, this is a uh, relationship for all of us. Good morning. Is everybody good to go here this morning? Okay, too much fruitcake over the holidays or something? Okay, great. Good to see you here. We're going to be talking for the next six weeks about relationships, and um, none of us want uh, bad relationships. We don't want relationships where they're, they're, it's just filled with anger or bitterness or uh, ongoing fighting, shame. We don't want those types of relationships. We want good relationships. And I believe if you let God work, uh, that you can have better relationships. We all can. So we're going to look at six steps, one each week for the next six weeks, that you can take towards better relationships. And we're going to look at the first step today, which really is the key step. Uh, but before we do, I want to just kind of give a context to the series. So I'd like to share just a few things about relationships. So if you have a, your teaching uh, outline there, you can write a few notes down. The first one is this, relationships are God's idea. From Genesis to Revelation, we find a God that has revealed himself to us as a personal God, a relational God. Uh, for example, right at the beginning of the story of God in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, we read this, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Now we ask the question when we read that verse, Who's God talking to? Us and our, that's, those are plural pronouns. Who, who's he talking to? He hasn't made us yet. And that's where we get the concept uh, that we find right through Scripture of the Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. And next week we're going to talk about how those persons are different, but yet they're one God. So God, uh, what we want to understand this morning is, is God's nature is that of a connected an attached being. Somehow, um, you know, and we can't uh, understand this fully, but somehow within the Godhead, there is this giving and receiving between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, God is an attached and connected being. And God then says, let us make mankind in our image that we are relational beings because we've been made in the image of a relational God. God designed us for a relationship with himself and with one another. That's why we have this powerful need to belong. Uh, we were all born with this longing for attachment and connection. We are social creatures. And because relationships are his idea, uh, they matter to him. Do you know what matters to God? Do you want to know what matters to God? Jesus tells us in uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. This is what matters to our relational God. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And uh, if you're a parent here, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer for your children or your child that they would know and love God with their whole being. So love the Lord your God. Jesus goes on to say, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. As a parent, you want to pray that your child or children will love other people. Now, the context of this is that Jesus was only asked, what is the greatest commandment? He, the, the religious leader that was um, asking about God was asking, what's the greatest commandment to God. Uh, in that day, uh, and even to this day, but there, uh, there were religious experts who held that from uh, Genesis through to Deuteronomy, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, there were 613 laws. So they would go around, it's like a system, which, which one matters to God the most? And Jesus said, because God is relational, loving God uh, is the most important one. But Jesus says, really, there's not just one command, there's two. The phrase, there, uh, the phrase, the second is this, has the idea that, that this is hinged to this. So loving God with our whole being is attached to 
loving our neighbors as ourselves, loving people. You can't separate them. They go together. Uh, so uh, these relationships uh, that matter to God, um, uh, these two relationships, uh, they're connected. Uh, Jesus, when he came to earth, leaned into community, not away from community, because he's a relational God. And Jesus, over and over again, as he's teaching people, kept reminding them about a God who is relational, a God who loved them. God loves you. And one of Jesus' followers, John, would later write in 1 John that we love because he first loved us. This is love not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So this love in our relationships, it all starts with God. That we're to love him and love others, but it's in response to his love for us. When ex you experience that love, it really does change you. Uh, imagine, if you will, someone was asking you um, to get together for a coffee tomorrow, and um, you're still on your holidays, you're not working, I guess, but they ask you for a coffee, and um, so you're at the coffee shop, and you're waiting, and the person is 30 minutes late, and uh, they finally come in, and they say to you, I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, let me explain what happened uh, to me. I was just getting in my car on the way here, and uh, my car, car was parked next to an apartment building, and a grand piano uh, from the 18th story, okay, so you're getting for coffee together in, El in Waterloo, not Elmira, right? 18 stories. <laughs> this grand piano comes down and smashes me on my head, and it made a mess of everything. I couldn't find my keys, and uh, so that's why I'm late. You would probably, as a thinking person, say, I think you're lying. Because if a grand piano hits you on the head from 18 stories, you'd probably look a little different and talk a little different and walk a little different. That, that we all know that that type of force would change us. It wouldn't leave us the same. And that's the idea that John, a follower of Jesus, had. He says, when you experience the force of God's love, when you get it, when it comes upon you, uh, it changes you so that you love God and you love other people. It starts with God and his relationship uh, to you, his love for you. So relationships are God's idea, and they matter to him. Second, um, relationships provide great joy or great pain. When relationships are going well, you've got some good relationships. Wow, they're life-giving. Um, those relationships enable you to, to face the challenges at work or wherever you are. Uh, but on the other hand, if your relationships are not good, those relationships color the rest of your life. And man, it's just harder. You struggle more because you, you don't have those good relationships. So um, great joy and great pain. And just a note there too, that if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, he wants you to have better relationships. In fact, as you begin to apply his teachings to your life, you'll find yourself uh, a better person. You'll be a better uh, husband if you're married, a better uh, wife, a better uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, better friend, better aunt, better uncle, better grandpa, better grandma, if you follow Jesus, because he wants to move you towards uh, health and wholeness. And then the third point is, in Christ there is hope for relationships, that uh, Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, changes people, he changes relationships, and this has happened over and over again down through time. And even if the person you're in a relationship with doesn't want anything to do with God or, or doesn't want to change, um, Jesus still wants to change you. And his power is still available to you. So I want to just, uh, again, on a final note, uh, talk about three levels of relationships. And maybe you can ask yourself where you are. Uh, the first one is there are dysfunctional relationships. These are relationships that are draining and distressing there's not a lot of trust in these relationships. There's a lot of drama. Okay. Do you have any of those relationships? Uh, the second level um, are functional relationships. Those are the relationships that are beneficial and satisfying, where uh, the people in the relationship, they get along, and it's mutually beneficial, um, and it's satisfying. This is a good relationship. Do you have some of those relationships? Ultimately, here's where Jesus wants uh, to take you, you doing your part, 
uh, is enduring relationships. These are the relationships that withstand the test of time, they withstand conflict. Conflict is inevitable as we relate to one another, but you work through the, that conflict and the relationship endures. And these relationships are not just beneficial, but they're enriching. You're a better person because of this relationship, and the, person, the other person is a better person because you're in that relationship. And they're also compelling. These are the ones that you, you want to bring something to it. You want to give of yourself. So, so wherever you are on that spectrum as far as relationships, uh, you, as a follower of, of Jesus, you want to keep praying and working towards that first level where you have good relationships, better relationships. So everybody ready to go this morning? Okay, we're going to look at six steps that we can take towards better relationships. And here's the first step uh, w- that we're looking at today. It's the key one. Is this, pursue wholeness. Pursue completeness. Because the more whole that you are, the more that you are like the person God designed you to be, the better your relationships will be. In the garden, when God created the first man and woman in his image, they were whole. They were in a right relationship with God, they loved God, and they loved one another. But at the beginning of the story we read in Genesis 3 that they sinned against God, and sin separates us from God, from ourselves, from other people. That we find ourselves today, years later, broken. But... There's coming a day um, when we will be whole again. In the eternal age, uh, we will be the people that God has designed us to be. But in the meantime, as we're broken, we're called to follow Jesus on this journey to wholeness. And the more I become like Jesus, the more whole I'm going to be. So pursuing wholeness really is pursuing God. You weren't designed to be angry at people. You weren't designed to carry shame. You weren't designed to be bitter. You weren't designed to be selfish. That's all a result of the fall. And when you pursue wholeness and you become less selfish, less bitter, uh, you carry around less shame, then you're going to have better relationships. So pursue wholeness, pursue completeness. Well, how do we do it? And really... It, it, it's us fixing our focus on a relationship with God. It starts with him. So I'd like to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at three uh, passages this morning that have to do with being complete and whole, that have to do with relationships. First one is Matthew chapter 6. And this is a familiar passage to some of us. And when we think of this passage, we think about provision which it is, it's a, it's a passage about that, but primarily it's a passage about relationship. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read through verses 31 and to 33. Verse 31, Jesus says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So Jesus says... You have these legitimate physical or material needs. You need water. You need bread. You need a roof over your head. You have those needs. But he says, but don't be like the pagans. Who are the pagans? Pagans are people that don't know God. They're not in a relationship with him. They're doing life without God. Because of sin, it separates us from him. And these are the people that are doing life without God. He says, They are running after, they're pursuing, they're focused on, they're chasing these things. Jesus says, he makes this statement, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Notice heavenly Father, relationship language. Those things that you need, those material needs... There's somebody that knows that you have those needs. He's your heavenly father. You're in a relationship with him. And he not only knows those needs, but he's capable of meeting those needs. He has what you're looking for. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first has the idea of fixing your focus, making God, your heavenly father, the center 
of your focus. That's what you are focused on as you journey through life. Now, it's not just the physical needs that our Heavenly Father wants to provide us with, but it's relational needs and spiritual needs. All of our needs, ultimately, are found in Him. So when it comes to relationships, we are social creatures because God is personal. He's a relational God. When it comes to relationships, we have needs. Some psychologists uh, will, will share a list of 60 different relational needs, psychological needs, attachment needs. I want to share with you probably like the top four. These are near the top. First, we all have a need, you have a need, for acceptance, to be welcomed. We have a need for security, to be safe. We have a need for support, that we find strength and encouragement from others. And we all have a a need for care, that, that someone would pay attention to us. Those are valid relational needs that you have. But instead of looking and running after and chasing those things like someone that doesn't know God may do, you're instead to pursue your Heavenly Father, to fix your focus on Him, to chase after Him, because He has ultimately what you're looking for. Ultimately, those needs are met in Him. I want to ask you this morning, where is your focus? Is it on things and people? Or is it on God? If it's on a person, um, it kind of looks like this, where you are in a relationship, maybe it's husband-wife, maybe it's as a parent, child, uh, as a friend. Um, The temptation for us is to look to that other person to meet our needs. I need you to accept me. I need you to make me safe. I need you to pay attention to me. Those are valid needs, but ultimately that person cannot meet those needs. Ultimately, those needs are met in our Heavenly Father. And so this is a challenge that we find in our world today, is that instead of focusing on God, we're through music, media, we're constantly told, you don't need God. There's no talk of God. And so when we're not focused on God meeting those needs, what do we do? Of course, we're going to look to things and people to meet those needs that he can only meet. Uh, For example, let me give you an example of what this looks like. Jesus is speaking to uh, a woman at the well in John chapter 4. And this woman has had five husbands, and the person that she's living with now is not her husband. So this woman, we can kind of imply from the story that she's got these needs, and, and we don't know her whole story. And Jesus, at this well, takes this, the, the idea of the living of, of, um, of water, physical water, and he turns it towards uh, the conversation towards spiritual water. And what he basically says to this woman is, I'm what you ultimately need. I am the living water. If you make me the center of your life, if I'm the one that's going to... Um, quench your thirst. If you look to me, you'll never be thirsty. I'm the one ultimately that can satisfy. And so that, for all of us, is a reminder that we're looking at Jesus. We're looking at the Heavenly Father. We're looking to the Holy Spirit. We're looking to God instead of fixing our attention on other people and expecting them to meet needs. Um, Let me give you a couple examples of what this looks like today. We've got this eternal um, thirst And the only one that ultimately can meet that thirst is an eternal being. It's God. And Solomon, 3,000 years ago, uh, said, listen, you can try this and try that to meet your needs, but ultimately it's God. He's the one that can satisfy your needs. Um, Many of you, uh, some of you may be familiar with Drake, who is a hip-hop artist, and uh, lots of downloads on Spotify. Um, I'll be honest, I have never listened to a Drake song and um, I'm going to go to my deathbed, probably never listening to Drake's song, but you, you're here, and maybe you identify with him. But here's a guy who, who has money, and, and, and uh, people are listening to him as he sings, and he shared uh, publicly that he's got this void in his life. What's that void? It's the God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. It's that eternal thirst. That he had this void in his life, and there was a point in his life where he said, I used to sleep with a different woman each night. 
thinking that that could fulfill my void. Tom Brady, another example, uh, who, uh, this was after he won his third Super Bowl ring. Uh, he's got five now, right? Uh, the football player. And by the way, just a shout out to all you Bill fans, uh, like myself, um, Buffalo Bill fans, um, life sometimes isn't fair. So uh, <laughs> keep praying. Uh, but Tom, Tom Brady, after he won his third Super Bowl ring, uh, in an interview, says, it's great, but it's not all it's cracked up to be. There's still got to be more. There's something more. W what is Drake and what is Tom Brady and uh, Solomon and all these people they're talking about? They're talking about the fact that you've been made primarily, first and foremost, to have a relationship with God. And you've got to seek him first if you want to be whole. It starts with him. So if you're here this morning and you're married, um, now, you can only control yourself, but uh, um, ideally, uh, your spouse um, wants to change as well. If you're married, that God wants to be the center of your marriage. Now, you may ask, well, wait a second, I know some people that don't know God, and um, they have a good marriage. They like being together, they work through conflict, that's true. But... If God's not the center of that marriage, sooner or later they will wake up and realize there's got to be more to this. Why? Because we weren't made for marriage and family. That's not the important, most important thing. We were made for God. And until he's at the center, we're missing something. Parents, a reminder, if you're a parent here this morning with your child, you want God to be the center of your family. We all, every home has a culture, and we can cultivate that culture. And you don't want to be the center of your home. You want your children or your child to be the center of home. You want God to be the center of your home. Not a part, but the center. And um, yes, we're not perfect and busy, and we're taking kids to music lessons, and maybe they got to do their homework and, and all of that, but... More than anything, your kids need to know that Jesus is the most important thing in your home. He's not an add-on. And so that's why you go to church. That's why you pray at the supper table. Even a simple, thank you, Lord, for this food, amen, let's eat, right? You're just over and over. Jesus is the center of your home. As a parent, that's what you want. Um, my children are all you know, in, going into that young adult stage, and I don't know how many more Christmases they're going to be at home with us, but my wife and our three kids, the five of us, were home for this Christmas, and as a father, I just loved it. Um, so anyway, we opened the gifts, right, and we do it one at a time. Hello, everybody? One at a time, right? Don't just whip through, one at a time. And after we were done, I just felt compelled to say, you know, just to, or something to this effect, just want to remind us, we're all going to die. <laughs> and all of these gifts, right, are going to end up in a landfill sooner or later. <laughs> kind of highlighting that Jesus is the most important gift. Make Jesus, as best you can, the center of your home. And then if you're single, make Jesus your focus. Instead of, and I've mentioned this before, instead of if you're single, and if you want to be single, and God's called you to be single, I just want to share again, there's this myth that you're not experiencing life until you're married. That is so not true. You can be single and whole, single and fulfilled. That's, Paul was like that. Jesus was like that, single. So reject the, I need to get married to be whole. That's not true. And you also need to reject the, I've got to find the right person myth. Because when I find the right person, uh, I'm gonna, everything's going to be okay in my life. Now, there may be a person God has for you out there, but your focus is not on that person. I've got to find you to make my life whole and complete. Instead, you're focusing on God, your relationship with him. So, when you focus on God and you're saying, okay, God, I'm, you know, I'm, unselfish, I'm selfish or I'm bitter or I got this, when you work on that and you're working your relationship with God to be whole, then... Maybe God will bring the right person 
across your path. And not to say if you haven't found the right person, you're those things, but our focus is always on finding the right person as opposed to becoming the right person. Being whole and happy is not finding the right person, it's being the right person. And you do that by focusing on your relationship with God. Seek first his kingdom, his rule in your life. And then another relationship passage is uh, Philippians 4, and uh, Paul says this in verse 19. And my God, notice the relation, relational language, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul is basically saying, you know what Jesus said when he said, seek first the kingdom? It's true in my life, and it can be true in your life. My God, he's met all my needs. And the context is physical needs, but from Paul's life, we can uh, also say his emotional needs. Paul didn't have women in his life, wasn't on Spotify, didn't have Super Bowl rings, but he had God. My God is enough. Uh, one thing about Paul, um, he, he went through life and was on this journey to wholeness, and we do find, though, that he was lonely. It's not good for man to be alone, right? That we, uh, not necessarily need a marriage partner, but we need friends, we need you know, other human beings. But it starts with God. But Paul was, uh, at times, felt alone. And that's a, I just want to remind all of us, that's an ex human experience. We all, whether we're single or married, we all experience loneliness from time to time. And, and sometimes uh, some of us more uh, than others. But the answer is not, again, I've got to find somebody. It's I've got to get my focus on God. Someone said this, I think it was in the New York Times, very uh, interesting, but something to this effect, and, and it really resonated with me. The person said, the practice of prayer, so that when you're focused on your Heavenly Father, you're focused and you're praying, the practice of prayer is how a person with, human being with infinite desires meets a God of infinite fullness. Wow. That God is enough. Yes, he may use people, but that's secondary. Yes, we want people to accept us and that we'd be safe and secure, but first it starts with God. Let me, uh, uh, l yeah, look at this statement here. This really is what we're talking about this morning. If you try to build a close relationship with another person before you've done the difficult work of getting whole with God, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. And that's a poor strategy. Why is that a poor strategy? Because nobody was designed to complete you, to make you whole. That's God's job. That's not another person's job. Ultimately, this compulsion for completion that we have is met in our Heavenly Father. It starts with Him. And because of the fall, because of sin, instead of looking to God, we look to other people or things to meet that need or those needs, relationship needs that ultimately are met in God. So don't buy into these two relationship lies that we hear from time to time. The first one, I need this person to be complete. Don't put that on someone. They're not big enough to make you complete. They weren't designed to make you complete. The gaps you have in your life, they're not the one that ultimately will fulfill those gaps. What you're saying is, um, yeah, unless you accept me, unless you're my security, unless you're my support, um, I'll never, never be whole. We sometimes call it, the, uh, it's, it's sometimes referred to as the Jerry Maguire syndrome, right? Touching line where Jerry's girlfriend says to him, you complete me. It's a touching line, but it's not true. You're setting yourself up for disappointment and heartache because that person is fallible and human and um, finite. Don't put that pressure on someone else. Um, let me just share a few uh, lines from some songs. Okay, this is a challenge for us to get our focus on God, start with him um, instead of getting it on someone else. Uh, here's some love songs. Okay. Uh, here's the first uh, line from a love song. Losing you is losing the sun from my life. I don't know what artist sings that, but isn't that is it touching? Losing you is losing the sun from my life. Whoa. 
Uh, here's another one. Uh, losing you is like living in a world with no air. Whoa. Some of you guys, you need to copy that down. That's good. <laughs> Woo. And then the last one. Being with you is like going to church. <laughs> Any human being was not designed to be your son, your heir, or the person you worship. That's God's job. And you have to fight against that sort of thinking in our culture and say, wait a second, I'm not looking to people to complete me. I'm looking to God. So I need this person to be complete is one line that you have to reject. The second one is, if this person needs me, then I'll be complete. This is the lie where you, you, you're driven by this need to be indispensable to someone. That if, if they desperately need me, then that gives me value and worth, and that'll make me complete. You're not anybody's savior. Don't play that role. You were never meant to, to do that. So when we look at relationships, they matter to God. Great pain, great joy. Jesus wants to work in your relationships. How? Do, how? By focusing on him, on God, on your Father. Jesus, another relationship passage um, is in John chapter 15, and, and this is where we read these words. Speaking about relationships. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So Jesus is walking with his followers, and they're very familiar with grapevines, the vine and the branch. It's a little more foreign to us. But he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and the, uh, our Heavenly Father is the gardener. And he says, L love, uh, he says, remain in my love. He's saying, Remain connected to my love. Stay charged, if you will, to my love. And that's why we come to church week after week to remind ourselves of the love of Jesus. The fact that there's someone that loves you more than any other person in this world, and the greatest demonstration of his love was giving of himself so that you could be forgiven of your sins and you could be restored to God. And we come each Sunday to be reminded how much God loves us. Yes, we have times where we doubt his love, where we're like, God, if you really love me, uh, why is this happening and why is that happening? But as you read more of the story from Genesis to Revelation, you realize life is not about you. It's about God and he's got his plan. And even in the midst of those doubts, you hold to the fact you remain in Christ's love for you. So that's why Sunday after Sunday, that's why each week you got to get alone with God and remind yourself, even if it's daily, Lord, you died on the cross for me. You love me more than anybody. Jesus says, remain in my love, that you're focused on him, and then notice, out of that, you love other people the way that he's loved you. Your focus is on him as you journey through life. Uh, you're on a journey to completeness. You want to become more like Jesus, and the more you become like him, the better your relationships will be. If I'm full of anger, and I realize that Jesus is not angry towards me, it enables me to not be angry towards other people. If I realize that, that, that uh, God is generous with me, it enables me to be generous with other people. If I realize God has forgiven me, I can forgive other, piano, uh, other people. It's like, again, a piano hitting you each day. Boom. Okay, God. No, it's a struggle. We're human, and there's lots of things that come up. But what's... The call today for us is this. Here's God's message for us today. Stop looking to other people to ultimately meet your relational needs. Seek me. Focus on me. Stop saying, I need you to complete me or you need me to complete you so that I'll be complete. And get your focus on God and by faith say, God, I want you to make me whole. You're the one that ultimately can fulfill me. You're my security. You're my acceptance. You're my support. You're my care. 
Job says he, God says he wants his job back. He's a good, good father. He says, I know what you need, and I have everything you need. I can help you. So this morning, will you fix your focus on your heavenly father? Will you pursue him? And in doing so, you'll pursue wholeness, which then will uh, help you in all your relationships. Next week, we're going to start look at step number two, but it really starts with you and God. So I'm going to invite you um, to bow your heads if you like, and we want to take just a moment this morning to respond to our relational God. Not sure where you are on your journey to wholeness, but if you have been looking to other things or other people to make you fully satisfied and complete, would you confess that and say, God, you're ultimately the one that I need. Lord, would you help me as I journey through this year, journey through life, to keep my focus on you, to stay plugged into your love for me. Take just a moment and then I'll pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of life, that you bring life to our soul, you bring life to our relationships. And Lord, I pray for each person here this morning that if they haven't started this practice, they would begin today to look to you first. Lord, I pray that you would reveal more and more of yourself to each of us as we journey through this next year. Lord, ultimately, you're the one that can make us whole. Help us on that journey towards that. Lord, thank you that you're willing to meet each of us wherever we are on that journey. And so I'm asking in the days ahead, God, meet each person, work in their hearts.